Hey, uh, via telephone, we've got uh, Delegate Paul Espinosa. He is the uh, Speaker Pro Tem and a former education chair in the state as well and is uh, spending time on the Finance Committee too. Paul, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Mac. Good uh, morning, John. Good to be with you all. I was going to ask you uh, how you felt about you know, young folks working around the radio station, but it sounds like WRNR has been pioneers in this uh, in this uh, field. We've got a four-year-old who cooks like you wouldn't believe. We have, we have Skittles and maple syrup all the time. It's just tasty as can be. I think his dad's well, a dentist. Tell- it's a plant. Yeah, I can tell you, and I think you're aware, Paul Jr., uh, when he first got involved in pro- broadcast journalism, of course, I did a lot of uh, uh, broadcast on the local uh, school channel in uh, in Jefferson County. Uh, I think it was Channel 19 or 18. I think they flipped at one point. But mm-hmm. uh, uh, I, I uh, you know, at first I know just the title of that bill seems a little, uh, you know, queasy, but uh, makes you a little queasy. But it does uh, certainly provide uh, young folks an opportunity to take that maybe that first summer job, work a few hours a week. And I do think there's sufficient uh, safeguards in the bill just to, again, just allow folks to begin to explore. And in the case of Paul Jr., it certainly turned out to be a career. Uh, he, uh, of course, went on to uh, serve as a uh, news anchor and later sports director for Channel 25 in Hagerstown and now uh, uh, still utilizes those skills as track announcer for the Charlestown races. Uh, he does a lot of social media work for them so uh, I think it's a good thing to provide uh, folks uh, you know with uh, certain uh, safeguards opportunities to uh, uh, um, you know begin to explore you know what they might want to do for a career down the road I just want to know how the old true grit newspaper got away with do you remember did you ever deliver I mean I was not 13 or 14 when I delivered those things I was child labor getting those there was an exemption for papers is that what okay for newspaper delivery you could be like I don't know eight or nine or (laughs) ten if you had like a parent accompanying you. And I also remember, Paul, you were allowed to caddy on a golf course when you were 14 when I was a kid. Now, I don't know if, if you've ever caddied. I had a cousin who did that for a long time, uh, going through uh, school and whatever. But of all the jobs to have as a kid, that's one of the toughest ones. You're going to take two big bags of golf uh-huh. clubs and you're going to walk 7,000 yards and when it's about 95 <laughs> degrees outside, and yet you're allowed to do that as a 14-year-old, but you couldn't work behind the counter of uh, a, a soda shop, right. right? You couldn't make milkshakes at, at the Baskin Robbins or whatever because that was a violation, but you could schlep two golf bags for four <laughs> or five hours on a Saturday afternoon in 95-degree heat. It didn't make any sense to me. But I, I do think that uh, with the appropriate protections, there's no reason why 14-year-olds, even 13-year-olds, can't do certain types of jobs if they if they want to work. Like Mike said, we're not asking them to go into coal mines. So. Well, aside from carrying my own bag, I really haven't had a lot of experience there. But uh, I did have a paper route, or actually my brother had a paper route for one of the area newspapers. And for several years, I assisted my brother on our bicycles uh, with our baskets crammed full of uh uh, of newspapers, uh, delivering those papers, and uh, it was a good experience. I- I'm glad to have done it, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it uh, wasn't too fun on uh, rainy days, especially when you're <laughs> trying to not only keep yourself dry, but keep mm-hmm. your newspaper dry and keep it out of the neighbor's shrubbery. <laughs> it uh, it uh, <laughs> right. was uh, definitely an experience. <laughs> you fold that. You got to fold the newspaper the right way, and then those things will fly, baby. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. You just have to be the careful; they don't fly too far. <laughs> yep, you got to be careful who you hit. <laughs> I hope that you're somewhere around the, the appropriate address there, uh, Paul. Let's talk about uh, the effort to eliminate Social Security taxes, and and this is the state income tax uh, uh, levied on uh, Social Security income, I should say, uh, in West Virginia. Part of that, I think, it's under a hundred thousand dollars has already been eliminated. Correct. Yes, uh, back in 2019, we actually passed legislation that uh, eliminated the state tax on Social Security benefits for couples earning less than $100,000 or uh, single persons or those uh, filing separately under $50,000. And that hit a lot of uh, individuals, and together with the uh, tax reform we did last year, the 21 and a quarter percent reduction in uh, personal income sta- tax, uh, state personal income tax. You know that 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 essentially eliminated a lot of those taxes for folks. But uh, this year, one of our priorities as a caucus was to uh, officially do away with the uh, tax on Social Security benefits, state tax on 
some Social Security benefits for, for all West Virginians, regardless of income. And so was very pleased on Friday to actually, uh, as a member of the House uh, Finance Committee, pass out legislation, uh, House Bill 4880, that would, in fact, uh, remove the tax on Social Security benefits uh, for all uh, West Virginians. Uh, similar to the manner in which we did the uh, initial um, uh, uh, tax exclusion uh, back in 2019, this would be a three-year phase-out, this being the first year, so it actually would be retroactive to January 1st of, of this year, and then by the uh, by the 1st of uh, 2026, uh, we would be completely uh, uh, tax-exempt as far as uh, state tax on uh, Social Security benefits. So really uh, pleased to support that legislation, and I fully anticipate that uh, that will gain uh, strong uh, support on the floor. It's actually on first reading today. Uh, tomorrow will be amendment stage, and then that would put it up for final passage in the House on Thursday. I understand that this uh, revenue amounts to $37 million annually, Paul? Yeah, that's uh, about what it is, uh, about $37 million. And it's it's roughly going to be phased in, you know, about a third each year. But just uh, as our uh, House counsel was explaining, you know, because, you know, it'll be coming in, you know, this year, it's not exactly a third, a third, and a third. But uh, the good news is, is that by the end of 26, uh, it will be completely uh, excluded from uh, folks' uh, personal uh, state income tax. We had your primary opponent, Senator Rucker, on earlier, and she had a similar bill in the Senate, and she said it didn't seem to be going anywhere at the moment. Is your bill identical to the one that is in the Senate, Paul, and do you have confidence if this gets out of the House, it will get some momentum in the Senate? Well, the governor's introduced bill, I think, would have just eliminated all of the Social Security tax at one time um, in order to make it more palatable for the Senate, because we did get a sense that the Senate you know, might not be uh, receptive to uh, the governor's proposed legislation. We thought that by uh, phasing it in over three years, it would accomplish two things. Uh, first and foremost, uh, might uh, support uh, gain the support of the Senate, and we're certainly uh, – uh, you know, going to be having uh, continuing discussions with the Senate to let them know that this is one of our priority bills. Uh, and also just, you know, together with all of the uh, various, you know, tax reform that we've implemented here over the last several years, it's just, you know, we, we uh, again, reduced uh, the personal income tax, uh, state income tax by 21 and a quarter percent. Uh, effective uh, January 1st of this year, all of your taxes that are paid on your uh, vehicles, uh, that's going to be fully reformed fundable on your state uh, uh, tax return. Uh, we implemented a 50 percent uh, tax uh, exemption for those uh, for small businesses uh, on their uh, business equipment, uh, 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 business equipment. And so uh, that together with just some of the other uh, uh, legislation we passed uh, over the years. And I think some I think we if I'm not mistaken, I think that we have enacted uh, over 20, close to 25 different tax uh, reductions uh, since uh, we took the majority back in 2015. Again, it's just a matter of just taking a, uh, a prudent approach, a cautious approach, just to allow some of these other tax reductions to kind of uh, have the positive effect that we're seeing, for example, with the personal income tax, even though we've uh, reduced the personal income tax, uh, uh, the state personal income tax by 21 and a quarter percent. As we've reported, uh, I've reported, uh, 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 I know uh, uh, leader uh, householders reported, you know, we're not seeing nearly that reduction in our actual revenue. So it does seem to be having a positive economic effect. And by phasing it in, we just think that's a more prudent, cautious approach that has served us well in the past. John Gilstrap. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've talked about this earlier with um, uh, Patricia Rucker. Apparently, the House of Delegates wants to throw librarians in jail for um, – for allowing obscene books to be in their libraries. At least that's what the headlines are telling me. I'm going to guess the truth is something different. Where are you, are you aware of what I'm talking about in terms of, of this Absolutely. obscenity yeah. bill? Yeah. It, Give us the reality of that, please. Sure. You're exactly right, John. I mean, that's the headline. And I can appreciate that when uh, folks, you know, do just read that headline in the, in the media, you know, that's, the, you know, there's, a, there's immediate concern, but the reality is, is that uh, all this does is uh, would eliminate uh, the, um, 
what I want to call exceptions uh, to the uh, criminal violation of knowingly and purposefully disseminating uh, or making available uh, uh, obscene material uh, to to young folks, to our children. And as uh, I think Brandon Steele, the sponsor of this legislation, kind of uh, uh, captured it on the floor, if it's illegal out in the parking lot, why is it legal in the library? So again, an individual, if you knowingly, and, and that's a key uh, term here, this is not something that's accidental, that something that you know, just kind of slipped through the cracks. If an individual knowingly disseminates obscene material, and, and the definition of obscene, it's, it's been clearly uh, delineated by both uh, the uh, federal, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, as well as our state Supreme Court, uh, if they knowingly disseminate that information or make that available, uh, that's what we're talking about here. And again, uh, the question I guess I would ask for folks that don't think this is a good idea, I would ask them, why is it illegal for someone to do that, again, out in the parking lot, anywhere else, but we're going to allow that in our schools, our libraries, and our museums? Again, when you actually read the bill and understand what it what it says and what it does, I, I, I find it difficult to hear or to, to understand why somebody would oppose that. Now, to be very clear, and the bill is very clear, if a if material has artistic value, for example, uh, and again, that's all spelled out in the bill, and that's all been covered in court cases as well, uh, that type of material is not going to be excluded. You know, we heard some folks on the floor during the debate say that, well, the diary of Anne Frank won't be able to be uh, discuss because it has graphic material in it, or uh, to kill a mockingbird, you're not going to be able to do to discuss that because that that also has graphic uh, uh, content. Again, it's been well settled that those type of materials are artistic in nature and, and are not considered obscene by either our U.S. Supreme Court or our state Supreme Court. This what we're talking about here is clearly obscene material. And this legislation simply removes an exception uh, that I think is hard to justify uh, for folks that knowingly and intentionally distribute obscene material to our children. Well, I think you know, you you extrapolate out all all legislation starts with with the best of intentions, and then the devil's in the details. So, is there a circumstance here where um, little little Johnny Jones brings home a book? that mom or dad finds to be offensive because of the obscene material. Obscene is kind of a, there might be a, I forget which of the Supreme Court justices said about pornography, you know it when you see it. Um, and then in that case where Mr. and Mrs. Jones is upset, do they then call the police and then the police go to the library? And what are the mechanisms of enforcement into all of this? Well, one of the things that came up during debate on the floor uh, was that, you know, there, there's really two tracks here. You know, one of it is uh, one track would simply be, and this is not really covered by the bill. This is just what is already in place. And, and we heard testimony about this, I believe, in committee was that, you know, right now, most libraries do have a uh, policy in place to where if if a parent uh, finds a material objectionable for some reason, uh, there is a policy where most libraries, uh, and, and I suspect uh, even museums and, and schools, you know, have a policy by which you can raise that. So, you know, that, that's that's we're not trying to interfere with that type of a issue where someone just simply finds material objectionable. What this legislation is strictly dealing with is obscene material, uh, and just uh, making sure that uh, those type of materials, if they are in one of those, uh, if they are in a public space, that they're not being knowingly and intentionally disseminated uh, to children. So that's so there's a, a difference there, John. Again, uh, non-obscene material, that's covered by the, the policies that our, our libraries, museums, and so forth have. And I think that there are reasonable procedures in order to register concerns there. And uh, what we heard from librarians and what I've heard from librarians, for example, is that, you know, they take that seriously. They look very closely at that. If they do see something that is uh, objectionable, you know, they have policies in order to deal with that. 
Matt Miller. You mentioned that, that this law would remove I- exceptions to, to current law. Does it also add penalties, or are those potential penalties that have been mentioned in these articles already on the books as well? I think there are penalties involved there, uh, Matt. I don't have those right at the uh, tip of my fingers here, but there are penalties, uh, you know, for for that. But uh, again, the the clear the the prohibition on knowingly and intentionally disseminating obscene material that's already on the books as far as again, it's anywhere else that you do that, it's already illegal uh, in West Virginia. So this is just extending that same prohibition to our schools, our libraries, and our um, uh, museums. Is that bill moving along well, or or is there a lot of support for it in the House? That passed out of the House. Uh, Actually, uh, I think it was last week that that passed out. And uh, just to give you a little sense as to how legislation is flowing right now, uh, today is day 42 out of 60. So we're right up here against uh, the end of the the session as of – as of, I think, yesterday, uh, we have passed 30, 30 bills have completed legislative action. So that means that they've actually passed the House and the Senate. The House has actually passed out 131 bills, and I think the Senate is probably somewhere in that ballpark. And just, by, just so you have a sense, and I know we discuss this every year, uh, to date, 2,562 bills were introduced. So you can see that a, a relatively small fraction of, of bills, you know, do ultimately make uh, uh, make it into law. Uh, but uh, that is one of the bills that has passed out of the House. And so now we'll see whether the Senate uh, is interested in taking that up. Those numbers always leave me scratching my head as to do we really need that many additional laws? Because if we're doing that every year, at some point we've got millions of laws on the book. When is enough enough? Well, I think that's a fair question, Matt, and, and, I, and I have to admit that I come sometimes think, uh, wonder about that myself. Uh, I can only uh, provide some assurance uh, to folks who wonder whether we need more laws uh, by saying that the process is designed to make it difficult to enact laws. You know, again, it's, it's a kind of a winnowing process, you know, to try to determine which bills uh, really make sense to have and which ones don't. A couple other bills that I'm really excited that it looks like they're at least moving over to the – they moved out of the House and moved over to the Senate. You may recall, and we've discussed this on the program previously, that back in 2014 – our horsemen and our uh, breeders uh, were saw their uh, purse distributions reduced by 10 percent back in 2014 when the legislature and then Governor Earl Ray Tumlin were trying to budget the uh, balance the budget in a very difficult situation. Uh, they implemented what was what's been referred to as the haircut bill. Well, yesterday we're, uh, I was pleased to see a bill that I uh, was the lead sponsor for. Um, pass out of the House that would essentially just restore that 10 percent reduction. So I think that will really help the uh, the horse industry. Another little piece of legislation that local scout leaders came to me with was a bill that would just ensure that uh, our scout uh, organizations and other patriotic groups have an opportunity to interact with students and share opportunities to participate in those programs. That also passed out of the House unanimously and is over in the Senate. So uh, certainly a few bills that uh, I've sponsored that I'm really excited to see on the move and uh, ready for Senate consideration. Paul, yep. oh, go ahead, Matt. No, go ahead. I'll say HB 5298, this is relating to prohibiting a candidate who failed to secure the nomination of a political party in a primary election from seeking the same elected office as an affiliate with a different political party in the subsequent general election. I think this was a Don Blankenship concern a few years ago. Uh, is, it a, is it an issue that is so serious now that it needs a new rule? Well, this was an issue that was brought to me by a constituent, and we've actually seen that uh, in Jefferson County, it's my understanding. We do have what's known as a sore loser uh, statute in West Virginia. If an individual loses their uh, primary, they are prohibited from uh, uh, running as an unaffiliated uh, candidate in the general election. Well, it, apparently there was a loophole there where someone, if they were able to finagle uh, uh, themselves as a uh, appointee by a uh, third party that held a uh, convention and thereby appointed that individual as their candidate, they could, in fact, 
uh, appear on the general election ballot. Uh, I consulted with the Secretary of State's office, uh, Deke Kersey, and he confirmed that, yes, that is a loophole. And so this is basically just closing that loophole. Again, it's not stopping someone from running for office, but if they lose their primary election, this basically just says that uh, they cannot uh, finagle a way to be on the general election ballot. Paul, a final word is yours, sir. Well, again, it's uh, getting down to crunch time. Uh, March 9th is the last day of the legislative session. Uh, this week is really crunch time because all uh, legislation has to be out of their last committee by Sunday. Uh, here in the House, uh, probably our last meetings will be Friday, perhaps a few meetings on Saturday. So uh, if a bill is going to get out of the House uh, or, or if a bill is going to get out of, out of the Senate, they have to be out of committee essentially by the end of this weekend. That allows them to be read three days as required by our state constitution, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday last day. And, of course, Wednesday is crossover day. That is the deadline for non-appropriations bills to pass out of their house of origin. So, again, a very busy week here. So uh, lots of action uh, to keep, keep an eye on here at the, at the Capitol. Paul, thanks so much for your time this morning. Appreciate the opportunity, guys. Have a great day.